All right, good afternoon, everyone. Looks like there's still some people coming in, but I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, this afternoon, I'm going to be talking about uh, my experiences uh, with inversion of control containers and uh, why it is that I've become a fan of auto wiring. Uh, early on, I'm going to talk a little bit about terminology because sometimes terminology is a little complicated in this space. I'm going to talk about my personal history with uh, learning about inversion, inversion of control, dependency injection, and sort of uh, where, I, where uh, the whole path that took me to get to where I am now. And then we're going to look a little bit more in detail at some implementations and kind of talk a little bit about the future. So solid is something that I see a lot of people talking about. It's something that I've never actually given a talk on before, and that's because oftentimes I sometimes forget that the D in solid isn't about dependency injection. Uh, it's actually about depend uh, dependency inversion. And dependency inversion and dependency, dependency injection are very different things, but sort of related. Uh, dependency inversion itself um, is about decoupling dependencies between high-level and low-level layers. Inversion of control is something that's sort of, lim uh, sort of similar as well, and its idea is different than traditional programming in that you don't have um, objects defined in a procedural manner. You don't just define all your objects up front. You have something else within the application that's defining and building the objects for you. Dependency injection is actually an implementation of inversion of control. So that's why sometimes you'll see uh, a container called inversion of control or dependency injection container. There's also something called a service locator, which seems completely different from them once you understand what they are, but they're also related as well. Service locator is also another implementation of inversion of control. The reason this is confusing is because these things are all sort of related, but they're also very different. So you see dependency inversion is kind of off on its own thing, yet different parts of the inversion of control uh, line of things have uh, both inversion and dependency in them. So this is kind of why it gets kind of confusing for some people sometimes. And it doesn't really help matters that most of the people will implement these, or many of these implementations, actually come with their own container. So you'll see people talking about a dependency injection container, or an inversion of control container, or a service container, or sometimes they'll just call it a container, which is by no means an overloaded word or overly generic. So you know, if you see someone talking about a container these days, you have no idea really what they're talking about without something extra to go along with it. Once you start working with any of these containers, uh, you start looking at wiring. And wiring is just a way to uh, instruct the container, whichever flavor container it is, in how to uh, build the object graph. So a quick example would be uh, a Symfony YAML file that defines some objects and uh, which class they are and their argument lists. My very first uh, inversion of control container was Spring Frameworks container. How many people have used Spring Frameworks container? Oh, that's a fair number. Awesome. When I first learned about them, uh, I was also new to Java, and we were doing some J2EE stuff or something. I don't know what it was. There was something about Java beans. So Spring Framework uh, had a notion of beans within their container. And so I, for a long time, got really confused about the fact that these were just services. They were just objects that were defined. They weren't really beans by any means. I mostly stuck with the explicit wiring, and the explicit wiring was using XML files. So there were these big, massive XML files that defined how these objects were going to be constructed. They also had this notion of annotations. Um, annotations in Java are actually like a first class uh, citizen of that uh, ecosystem, whereas in PHP, annotations are kind of added on um, by other means. So I, I like the XML because I like the explicitness of it. I didn't really like this idea of putting this configuration stuff in my objects. So I was a big fan of the XML, uh, XML configuration. And it looks sort of like this. Uh, and if you're used to using Symfony's container, this probably looks pretty familiar. There's a beans, um, and then each bean has an ID. It has the class that that ID, or that that bean represents, and then potentially some uh, property setters or uh, constructor arguments. So I really started to get used to this idea and wondered you know, what other people were doing. So I talked to, to a friend of mine who worked at Google at the time, and he told me they were using Google's Juice, uh, which was a Python uh, dependency of injection container that um, focused mostly on the annotations. Uh, it's implemented a little differently in Python than annotations are, uh, 
um, in other languages, but it's the same idea, that you get to tell something that you're going to inject things into an object using um, meta uh, attributes on the classes or on the functions themselves. And this kind of uh, gave me a chance to talk to him about a problem that I had seen, even when I was looking with the Spring implementations of, well, if you're defining this in the class itself, how do you get around this problem that sometimes you might want a different dependency? So if you have two, op uh, two objects that are the same class defined, but you want different dependencies for each one, how does that work? And um, he gave me a very unhelpful answer, and I wasn't very happy with it, because he basically said, you know, that doesn't happen very often, and if it does, there are ways to fix it. But he didn't really go into the details about how that works. So I just kind of wandered away from that whole notion and, you know, just kind of went with the, notion, with the idea that using explicit wiring was better because it was always there, it was explicit, it was separate from the objects themselves, or separate from the classes themselves, so I liked that a lot. In retrospect, uh, my friend probably was saying something that I should have paid more attention to uh, because what I've found since then is that that sort of doesn't happen very often and there usually is a way around it and it's usually not too painful. Uh, but it was almost a form of uh, premature optimization in my mind that kept me away from trying to explore some of these other uh, ideas for handling wiring. So back in 2008, I kind of left the Java world again and started to focus more on PHP. And I really wanted to try and bring some of these ideas back to PHP. Um, my problem at the time, though, was I was pretty much working on my own, completely isolated from anybody else. So I didn't have anyone else to just you know, throw ideas at or leverage anything else that anyone had worked on. So I was kind of working on my own little silo. So I started working on something called Substrate. And this was uh, more or less my attempt at a direct port of uh, Spring's IOC container for PHP. And since I had realized that beans were this cool little thing, I thought I'd use stones for my application. And I thought it was going to be neat because it sort of fit the naming conventions. Uh, so I had, had this idea of creating um, objects called stones. And everything was done using explicit wiring. And it was all done using PHP as the wiring language. And it really doesn't look altogether different from what uh, you might be used to seeing now if you ever use the PHP, um, PHP version of control containers that allow you to uh, define it within the PHP language. You told the context, in this case, uh, that's the name of the container, you told the context the name of the service, and then you gave it some information to help try and build that service, whether it be the class name, uh, constructor arguments, or whatever. I also started to play a little bit with this concept of auto-wiring. And the way that I did that was really basic. Um, I basically looked at all of the constructor args that were f on that class using uh, reflection. And then I would check to see if that, if that par parameter happened to be a class. And if it was, I looked through all of the existing stones to see whether or not an instance of that class was already in the, the collection of objects. And if it was, it would use that uh, it would use that object that had already been created. And this worked out really nicely for me. Uh, I was pretty excited about how it worked, and uh, for a, uh, a lot of ways, it made my configuration a little cleaner because I no longer had to define every little thing. So for example, if we had the uh, file system, a file logger that it takes a file name, and I had a log factory that took a file logger, the configuration only required that I define the, file, uh, the log factory and the log factory's class because the container could then go and figure out how to actually create the file logger. It turns out that writing your own framework and maintaining it all by yourself with no other users is, is really not a good use of your time. Um, and I think you're all here and you all are aware that using Symfony is better than trying to write Symfony yourself. Um, so I decided that I needed to, to go away from my little island and I found Symfony, which turned out to be more or less uh, a PHP port of Spring. So it felt very familiar to me. And um, it, it was beyond just the, the dependency injection component, but the dependency injection component itself was very exciting to me. Um, it was very flexible, and a lot of that was because it had the compiler passes. How many people are a fan of Symfony's compiler passes? Awesome. How many people are not fans specifically against uh, compiler passes? Nobody? Ah, uh, one, awesome. Yeah, so compiler passes are great. Um, they let you compile the container so that it's super efficient, but it's also very complicated and can be very complex. So 
while it's uh, wonderful to have, uh, it can also be the source of a lot of pain. If you've ever had to write a very complicated uh, compiler, extent, uh, compiler pass or uh, extension, it can be a lot of pain. But all in all, I was pretty happy, at least at that time, with uh, finding a dependency injection container in PHP that worked for me. It turned out that what I really liked was Silex. Once I started playing with the Symfony ecosystem, um, I, I made a couple of Symfony 2 applications just to try. Um, it was a little too heavy for me just to get going from, from what I had been doing before. So I found Silex, which was really nice. It was a uh, Symfony components, but instead of using the uh, Symfony's dependency injection component, it used Pimple, which, at least at the time, felt a lot more manageable to me. But what I hadn't realized over that whole time was that I was starting to feel this subtle pain in trying to work with both Symfony's, depend, uh, Symfony's container and Silex's, conta or Silex's container. So to kind of uh, show how these containers worked, I'm going to introduce you to a friend of mine called k.php. Uh, this file usually lives in the root of my projects. Um, it sometimes has siblings like k1, k2, k34.php. Uh, it's basically a, a scratch pad or playground that I can use to write uh, all of my code before I actually try to bring it into a framework. So in this file, we're going to put something called important service. Um, it's not super useful, but for our purpose, uh, it's going to be super important. Um, it has a constructor argument that needs a logger factory, and it does one thing, an important task. And that important task, the implementation, is going to get a logger, uh, use the logger factory to get the logger and then uh, log some information. So inside k.php, I've actually inlined this class, and then I've defined the actual uh, path, the object graph that needs to be created in order to be able to do important tasks. So this is the opposite of inversion of control. This is explicitly defining and controlling the creation of your objects. So we're going to go from here, and we're going to look at what this would be done, or how this would be done in Symfony. In Symfony, you might use something like the YAML loader to create the same exact objects, and then you would ask the container to get important service to do some important task. So these files are doing exactly the same thing. One is using inversion of control, and the other is not. Of course, with Symfony, you also have a similar path that you can do using the XML language as well. In the world of Silex, you'd use, something, you'd use Pimple. And Pimple is uh, pure PHP configuration. And it's implemented such that the keys of the, uh, of the container are actually the names of your services. And then you declare factories to try and create those objects. So here we have the file logger. Uh, it's actually a function that returns a file logger with uh, an object. You still ask the container to get important service, and then you can do the important task on the, the important service. Laravel's container, which I'm actually going to be talking about quite a bit, uh, looks very similar to, to the Silex implementation because the, the container was uh, actually started very, uh, I think it actually was Pimple in the very beginning. Um, and then TaylorOut will eventually move from Pimple to um, a, another container that was very similar. So if you look at the definitions for these two, they're very, very similar. The biggest differences are, instead of using array keys, uh, you actually define singletons. Um, the singleton still takes a factory as, as an argument. Um, and then you make objects. So if you need to make um, the logger factory, for example, you call the container to make the logger factory. So one of the things that I really liked about the Laravel ecosystem was that a lot of the um, packages and some of the core code actually did away with this whole notion of generating IDs. And this was something that I didn't really realize was a problem for me um, until I, I lived life without it. So rather than defining file logger as a string, um, you just use the class name. So you pass in file logger class. Uh, same thing with logger factory. Same thing when you make the file logger. You just pass in the class name of what you want to make, and the container gets it for you. Um, almost always, I end up using uh, backslash to dot notation for my service names anyway. How many people do that? Instead of namespace separator, you do dots. Nobody? 
okay. <laughs> I guess that was just me, but I did it all the time and it felt very redundant and I didn't really like it at all. So when I started using this thing with, you know, I could use like class name, colon, colon, class, I no longer had to actually come up with, with anything anymore and it really, really sped things up for me. So I thought this was great. Um, I just really did not like the, the idea of having to do the IDs and not having them was, was a great time for me. So the other side effect of this is that if the IDs are actually classes, uh, what if the container itself would be able to automatically create classes that you pass in if they weren't defined in the container? If make was able to do that, we could do something with the, um, a na the naive auto-wiring implementation I, I showed before and actually go in and say, okay, if it's for a class, if it doesn't exist, just make that class. So just assume that if I've asked for something that isn't in the container already, that I should be able to new it. Um, and use the same rules then to go back through um, and try to resolve its constructor args so that it could just cycle, you know, it would just automatically create its own dependencies. If we have something like this, if we try to make important service, do we have to define important service at all? Because if important service can be made by getting logger factory from the container itself, we can just get rid of it. Similarly, if we want to make the file logger class, we don't really need to define, or if we need to make the logger factory class, we don't need to define that either. Because the container would know to go in and, go, and create the file logger for us. Where it starts to fall down a little bit with uh, Laravel's implementation is, okay, can we create file logger automatically? And we can't, because the, file, the container isn't gonna know anything about how to get the first argument for the, <coughs> for the file logger itself. So it introduced an idea of binding primitives. And what binding primitives does is let you declaratively say that when the file logger class needs file name parameter, give it this value. So now this configuration file has changed such that the only thing that I'm actually specifying as far as classes for configuring the container itself is the file logger class. And we only have to define that because we need to be able to give it an, a parameter. Where this becomes really nice is when you start changing dependencies or making some, some certain types of changes to your application. If we go in now and say that important service um, has to, um, uh, if, if important service has to do something extra, we're going to have it do something more than just log something. Uh, we can add, say, like a connection class. And the connection class is just gonna have an execute method. So we're not gonna do anything interesting here, but we're gonna have it execute something. We could change the service itself, the class service itself, to take the connection and the, is the constructor arg. We'd be able to do something with that. So in do important task, we're gonna tell the connection to execute and then we're gonna to continue to log like we had before. We're gonna add all of this back into k.php to see how this wires together manually. And it's pretty easy, all we have to do now is add connection, and then we have to inject the connection into important service. So this wasn't too bad, um, at least as far as procedurally, generate our, uh, procedurally generating the, this code. If we wanna go into our services YAML file and now add this new dependency, which is what you would be required to do within Symfony, you would have to add a new connection, you have to create a new name, add a, cl a class that has the same exact name, and you'd have to explicitly say, I wanna use the connection object that we just defined. Same thing with the XML, you'd have to add this new argument again. In Pimple, um, Similar, you still have to add an, a new connection, create a new connection, and make sure that you ask for the connection. So it's this configuration of, uh, or this having to change configuration is sort of the thing that I was starting to rebel against a bit using these types of, uh, using these types of containers. What we would have to do for Laravel's container at this point in time, if we added this new connection parameter to the, um, to the object graph is nothing because a container can automatically create connection because it doesn't have any dependencies and it can automatically inject it into our important service because it knows how to 
to inject services. So we don't have to do anything at all. And it turns out that this is a wonderful developer experience, especially if you're doing any sort of rapid application development, experimenting, moving, uh, refactoring your code so that things are cleaner. You don't have to make a lot of configuration changes for many of the changes that, that at least I've been making over the last couple of years. And I sort of described this feeling um, a while ago, and I called it XML and YAML fatigue. Uh, having to go in for every single code change, for any single dependency change, and having to go in and either modify XML or YAML or whatever, uh, if it's pimple, it would be PHP, it just was really painful. And I started to feel like it was having a major impact on my design, and I hadn't realized that. Um, I, I started to resist refactoring my code because I didn't want to have to go back in and look at the configuration. Because every time I would try something new, I would have to go do uh, something weird in configs. It would take me longer. It would take me out of the code that I was working on. And it just wasn't a lot of fun. I also didn't have to do anything at all with service identifiers. Um, it just became a non-issue for me because everything was based on class names. So it was really, really awesome to work with. One of the things that, that was kind of difficult at first, or one of the things that had to be added in order to really move to this notion of just using uh, class names instead of uh, service identifiers was, was interface binding. Because sometimes you want to uh, type in against an interface instead of an actual concrete implementation. And to do that, uh, to uh, do a, an example of that, we're going to actually look at our logger factory. And instead of taking a file logger directly, we're going to change, uh, we're going to refactor our code. We're actually going to do some actual dependency inversion now. We're going to uh, make, make sure that the logger factory doesn't know about specific loggers. It's going to know about a logger, an interface logger. And the file logger now is going to implement this interface. So in order to do this, the only thing that we would have to change in the Laravel container now would be to bind, out, uh, would be to bind the logger class to the file logger. Now, without this, Laravel would have a huge problem because now the uh, logger factory is going to request a logger, which is an interface, and there's no way it can just new up an interface. Like, no matter how much magic Laravel throws at things, it's not going to be able to do that. So this lets you do that. This lets you bind an interface, to, or bind a specific interface to a specific implementation. And swapping out implementations now becomes very easy. So if we want to switch between a file logger and a uh, syslogger, or syslog logger, um, all you have to do is switch the configuration in one spot. It isn't a whole bunch of configuration files. It's just changing the class name. And if I go back to one of my earlier uh, problems that I had with this whole notion of auto-wiring or uh, not really uh, explicitly defining everything and trying to handle the problem of what do you have to do uh, if you have an object where you need multiple objects created with different sets of, um, with different sets of dependencies. And this is something uh, that, that is called contextual binding. And to demonstrate this, we're going to add another logger type called null logger. It's just not going to do anything at all. Because maybe sometimes we want the logger object to, or the logger factory to give us uh, a proper logger, and other times maybe we don't care, but we don't want to change the code that to, to, to handle the case of like a null logger, like an actual null value. We're just going to pass it in something that doesn't do anything. And we're going to create a new service called unimportant service. This unimportant service doesn't need to log. We don't know that. That service doesn't know that. But for the purpose of this talk, it doesn't need to log. So it's still going to take a logger factory, because maybe sometime later in the future, it's going to become important again, and we're going to swap out and want to actually do a file logger or a syslogger. So if we go back to our procedural file, k.php, things start to get a little more complicated. We can't just create one set of things anymore. Now I actually have to create a file logger, a file logger factory, and a connection, and then define the important service as its own thing. And then I need to create a null logger and a logger factory that has the null logger and pass that into a new unimportant service. So this is where things start to get a little more hairy. And this is where, uh, if you look at some old PHP code from like 10, 15 years ago, you end up with massive, massive files setting these sorts of things up. Uh, it can get very confusing very quickly. The way that this would be handled with Laravel is to use the contextual binding feature, which by default right now, we have the important service taking an important service, um, and the unimportant service is going to make an unimportant service. Right now, both will get the file logger. If we decide now that we want the unimportant service to no longer get a file logger, we want it to get a null logger, 
uh, we explicitly tell the container that when unimportant service needs a logger factory, then we're going to create a null logger and return a logger factory with the null logger. So this is where things start to get a little more verbose, uh, but it's still a pretty elegant solution because you're very clearly able to read exactly what's going on here. And this made, this made life easy, but also it hardly ever happened. Like in two years of coding uh, using uh, Laravel's container anyway, I didn't actually run into very many cases where I needed this. Uh, I actually used the, the parameter um, primitive context binding more than I used the interface, you know, conditional interface binding. So altogether, um, auto-wiring containers have a lot of pros, uh, at least in, from my perspective. Uh, I think it's an amazing developer experience. Um, and I think it's great for heavy refactoring sessions because you can stay within the code and not really have to go into uh, configuration to try and fix things all the time. So more code writing, less configuration wrangling for me is a huge win of auto-wiring containers. And I think that a lot of Laravel developers don't understand uh, how nice their life is because of that. Um, and I also think that a lot of people who haven't been exposed to auto-wiring containers really understand how much nicer life could potentially be uh, if they were able to use some more of these types of tools. Another pro is magic. Uh, it just feels like everything just works. Um, I'm a big fan of it. So uh, cons, uh, performance. Uh, this is all done at runtime using reflection, which is enough to make a lot of people just get up and leave right now. Um, I don't necessarily think, <laughs> thanks, Larry. Um, I think that uh, it's probably not as big of a performance issue as people uh, think it is, um, but it definitely isn't something that's going to be completely uh, inexpensive. Because it uh, deals with runtime and it deals with reflection, it's going to be difficult to optimize. One of the nice things about Symfony's container is that you are able to dump it to um, a PHP file that could just be executed, and you don't have to do any, any dependency resolution at runtime. Um, and another con is magic, because I know a lot of people are against magic. So I think that's both a pro and a con, depending on who you are. For me, the best of both worlds uh, would be if Symfony supported auto-wiring. And as a Symfony 2.8, uh, that was actually a thing. And I got super excited, and I looked at it and found out that the way that it was implemented was that you would be able to specify, in this case, that Service 2 uses auto-wiring. Um, so you still have to define the services that you want auto-wired, and you still have to give it a service ID. and I was like, really? <laughs> I, I, I was super excited to look at it. I looked at the implementation, I, and I became uh, kind of unhappy. But that really isn't a good attitude to have. So there were some people with better attitudes uh, that started to try and fix this problem, or fix some of these issues to make it a little more user friendly. And um, this, this particular bundle, the auto wiring bundle, actually enables auto wiring for all services by default and lets you whitelist the objects that you want to be not auto wired. So what that means now is that it took it to the next step where you no longer have to say auto-wire true. Um, by default, it's just going to auto-wire if it can. This solution helped a lot, but you still have to define the service IDs, which was one of my um, things that was kind of annoying. And you also still have to define the service. Fortunately, there's a, a pull request out right now, uh, 2264, uh, that makes it optional uh, to have the class name specified. So what that means is that instead of having defined the class name, if the class name is not defined, it defaults to the name of the service. Uh, this is actually already possible with XML, but it isn't possible yet with YAML. This pull request will make it possible with YAML. So that'll get us really far, but we still have to define the services. Unless you use something like the Action Bundle, uh, which is considered Symfony Controllers Redesigned. And what it does is it scans directories. You specify which directories you want to scan, and it dynamically generates services with class names as the IDs. And what that means is that if you have a class name, uh, if you have this particular class name, um, so you have a home page in your actions directory, and you ask for the router, and you ask for twig as constructor arguments, this is all you have to do. So you don't have to do any configuration. You don't have to do anything else. This object will automatically be available. And depending on whether you're doing uh, annotation routing or actual routing, you may not have to even touch the, um, may not have to touch any of the configuration at all. You can add this class, and you can start accessing this web page without having to do any configuration. And it's amazing. 
Uh, the, the action bundle is a little misleading in the naming because it's not actually specific to actions. Um, it's not specific to actions or controllers. Um, it can actually be used for any number of services. So you just give it, you give it the list of directories you want scanned, and it will scan them. So for me, this is pretty exciting because at this point, uh, Symfony's container will have performance, it'll have optimization, and it'll actually have some really nice developer experience for uh, defining at least controllers um, that you don't require any configuration at all that still follow really great principles of taking all of their um, arguments within the constructor. Um, there is still a little bit of magic, and I think if the uh, container world continues to go the, re the direction it is, uh, people are just going to have to get used to it, <laughs> I think, or just not use it. Um, in all of these cases, uh, the auto-wiring stuff is completely optional. So if we add these great features to Symfony or if these things become part of core, um, it's going to be optional. It's not going to be something that you'll have to do, but if you want to do it, you'll be able to, to leverage some really cool things. So all in all, the, especially over the last, I'd say, two or three months, I've been looking more and more at how Symfony's coming along with the auto wiring. And it looks like there's a lot of experimentation. There's a bunch of people who are really working hard to make this better. They aren't having the attitude that I had last year, where it's like, well, this isn't, this isn't good. They're actually looking at it as a good, good chance to try and improve Symfony. So if you're interested in this, definitely check out um, a bunch of the uh, auto wiring related pull requests or issues. Um, start, you know, talk to me, talk to anybody in the, the Symfony core team about how this could impact your life, what you would like, what you wouldn't like, what works for you. Um, so yeah, this is a really exciting time uh, if you're uh, into uh, dependency injection containers. So I think that's all I have for now. I don't know if I see everybody back there, so I'm not sure if there's questions or <laughs> if I went too long. Are there any questions or comments? No? Oh. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Um, you have some class uh, declared as a service, but it requires some parameter that is, is not an object. So you don't, you can, cannot use reflection to obtain the, the class name um, to so activate the, the, the auto wiring uh, mechanism. Is there any option? For example, a constructor that requires, that requires uh, an associative array or something like that. Is there right. any, any technique, any, any workaround? Um, so, the, so the question is, um, it's, it's sort of like the primitive binding where the, the command or the constructor argument is like a string or an, an int or something. Um, I'm not exactly sure how that's, I don't know if that's something that's been handled yet within the, the realm of Symfony. Um, I know that the, the solution in Laravel was to do the primitive binding, which worked, but it wasn't necessarily like uh, the best solution. Um, so I, I'm not exactly sure where, where the state of that is going to be. So that's a, that's a great question. I don't know. Um, that's something that I would definitely be looking for because it's something that would be important to me as well. Uh, one, of the, one of the hacks that I've done in the past on that is to create a subclass that uses constructor arguments as defaults and passes it to the parent, uh, which, which is a, it's like, it's, it's a very much a hack. But if you only have one instance of that in your entire code base, Great, you, you can do that. Um, and also, you can still wire up uh, intentionally your services. So if you have a service that needs these things, that might not be a good candidate for auto-wiring. Um, you know, th this auto-wiring isn't intended to completely disable or get rid of all of your configuration. Um, for services that do need configuration, that do need things set, then you, I think you should just set those and you, you shouldn't try to go around. But if there is ever a, a nice way to do uh, that sort of configuration with auto-wiring, that would be awesome. But I, I don't know what the, the plan is for that, for the people who are actively working on it. Thank you for your question. Thank I, you. I, yep. Are there any other questions? Sorry, can you pass the microphone? Comments? Okay, cool. Well, thank you.